Welcome back to another Q&A, guys. The first question this week asked me whether it's a good idea to have protein right before your training session. And this wasn't necessarily like in the specific context of training fasted, but more so like just generally. If you're going throughout your day and you're still in kind of a fed state, should you still have protein right before you train? Is that a good idea? And I think that when it comes to protein timing, it can be as easy as, hey, every three to five hours, get a protein feeding in of at least 20 to 30 grams. And as long as you do that and you start your day with a protein feeding, so starting your day, having maybe a protein feeding within an hour or two of waking, and then throughout the day, every three to five hours, having a protein feeding then I think that takes care of your nutrient timing around or at least your protein timing around your workout. And like, I think even whey protein, it takes like, we digest like at a rate of 10 grams of protein per hour or something like that, maybe 10 to 15. So still a pretty slow rate. So if you have protein a couple hours before training, you're still going to have amino acids in your bloodstream. You're still going to be digesting that. You're going to be totally fine there. So I think that that rule of thumb is going to work out just fine and you really don't need to worry about specifically timing your protein right before you go train. Now, if that's convenient for you or it's convenient for you to have a post-workout shake and that helps you hit your daily protein goals, then that's totally fine. I would say if you are training in the morning, it's probably a good idea to try to get a little bit of protein in before you go train as training fasted might result in a little bit more muscle protein breakdown if you don't have a little bit of protein beforehand. And I generally think that that would be a little bit better approach. And, you know, having 20 grams of protein or I believe even having carbohydrates can kind of blunt that muscle protein breakdown as well. So having some sort of food before you go train or maybe an intra workout shake if you're trading in the morning, might be a good idea. But outside of that situation, I think that you can kind of hit that daily recommendation and you'll be just fine there, all right? Next question, tips for sleep. So I I really struggled with sleep in in college to where my sleep schedule was really, really early, meaning I I worked at like, I had to open up our our rec center at like five in the morning and my roommate's sleep schedule, I lived lived with four other dudes and, you know, we're college guys. We tend to have a later kind of sleep schedule or often college guys do. And I definitely had a couple of roommates that were night owls and one in particular, I could hear them play PlayStation at like two or three in the morning. So... That wasn't always the most conducive thing for sleep, and the one of the best things that helped me was getting into a routine before bed, making sure to actually try to relax. I'm eating those words a little bit right now because I've just had have, have a really busy fall here, and I've been doing different things up until bed and it's probably not the best idea but I'm so tired by the end of the day to where it's like it doesn't matter but have getting in a relaxing kind of pre-sleep routine that can be super helpful sleeping in an environment where it's like pitch black and it's dark is good often people will say to sleep in a very quiet environment and I would say that would be my option number one but if you sleep with roommates and stuff like that and it's noises around you, option number two is maybe having a fan that actually produces some like white noise and stuff like that. That helped me. So that can help. And a big one is caffeine intake. So for me, I don't have any caffeine like nine hours before bed. So I'm basically done with caffeine by by lunchtime. And Some people can eat caffeine or have caffeine, eat caffeine right before bed and be just fine. So like my dad, he can drink a a Diet Coke right before bed and he's going to be just fine. 
or at least he says he's just fine. He might not even notice. But for me, I definitely notice if I have caffeine at all after lunch, it starts to impact my sleep. I can't get to sleep as well. And I'm sure some of that now is like me placeboing myself because I kind of believe that because I've seen it with my history, but it's probably a bit of both. But I definitely think watch that caffeine intake. Really, some people can get away with it, but most people, I would say, give yourself at least six to nine hours. And remember that it's cumulative, meaning if you have if you have a thousand milligrams of caffeine at one o'clock in the afternoon and you think that you're going to be just fine by bed, well, caffeine has like a six to nine hour half-life depending on how fast of a metabolizer you are. So six to nine hours later, that might put you, I don't know, like it, later in the evening, probably within a couple hours before bed. And a thousand milligrams, well, half of that, that's still 500 milligrams in your system. So it's cumulative. And the more you have, it's going to take longer for it to kind of completely get out of your system. And I think Revive Stronger just had Amy Bender on the podcast here. So very much so recommend checking that out and other episodes of the Revive podcast with Greg Potter. But I think that at least for me in the past, if I start to notice that I'm waking up with a little bit of a headache, that is kind of in what I think's going on there a little bit is I might be just starting to fully have that caffeine come out of my system. And I definitely think that that could be the case because sometimes I can get a little crazy with the caffeine and I don't think that I'm a very fast metabolizer. So to think that Hey, if I had like 500 milligrams of caffeine a certain day, could it take that long? Maybe. And if it keeps accumulating on itself, then you, you might really build up quite a bit of caffeine in your system. All right. So really watch that caffeine intake, consistent, relaxing routine before bed can really help. And I I think those are a couple of the biggest ones. All right. Question three, have I ever tried out like a very high protein diet? And I mean, that's that's pretty relative. I think that this question was like regarding some of the higher protein diets that you might see out of like Dr. Jose Antonio's lab to where they were going like, I don't know, like three grams per pound. That I'm not even sure if that was the case. Maybe it was, I think it was like four, four or five grams per kilo, which might have been like two, two to two and a half grams per pound. So for me, I'm about 180. So that would be like 300 plus grams of protein there. And I, I haven't gone that high. I'm generally on the higher end. I would say I'm generally around like 250 grams of protein, which if I'm 180, that's like one point one and a half grams per pound ish. And I don't necessarily do that because I think it's better for results. I do it more so because I have five meals a day and I just like having a nice portion of protein in those meals. I'm, I'm currently gaining. So even having five meals a day, if I'm getting like five or 10 grams of protein at each meal from carbs and stuff like that, well, that means I'm really only having 30 to 40 grams from a protein source at each meal. So it actually is quite easy for me and I generally try to try to maximize that MPS response from a quality source at each meal. So I try to shoot for 30 to 40 grams from specifically from a quality source at each meal. So if that puts me at five meals and I'm doing that plus some auxiliary protein from my carbs, well, that's why I land where I do. But I definitely think it could be lower than that and you'll be just fine as well. Now, Valentin Tamposi, he's a super good bodybuilder and he talks about he's trialed really high protein diets with clients and seen really good success with them. I think that, you know, I, I don't see a lot of downsides of just trying it out, assuming you have healthy kidneys and stuff like that. Now, some of those calories are going to come away from carbs. So that might not be the 
best idea to really sacrifice your carbs for training, but if you're eating enough carbs as well, then it might be worth a shot to see how you respond to that. I still wouldn't get like crazy with it. I wouldn't go to like three grams per pound or anything like that, but trying out one and a half grams per pound or a little more might be worth a shot and there could be some benefits to that. So I I generally think that over the long run, over the course of five years, if someone told me they had one, one and a half grams of protein per pound compared to like 0.8 or 0.9, do I think it would make that much of a difference? Probably not. But could it be slight? Maybe. And if I had to lean in any one direction, I'd lean towards being on the higher end. All right. So hopefully that helps out. Next question, food volume periodization. So kind of around, should you manipulate your food volume or try to manipulate your food volume depending on what kind of phase that you're in? And I absolutely think it's probably a good idea to try to keep your food volume pretty similar all the time if you can. So during a cutting phase, as your calories get lower and lower, gradually working up that food volume as you go. So not starting with all the food volume as soon as you start a fat loss phase. I think that's a good idea. As if you start a fat loss phase eating huge, massive salads and stuff like that, well, you've really put yourself in a position where you have nowhere to really turn to when you start getting hungry, which is going to happen. You can't really increase your food volume further because you've already played that card. And I I really think that the one of the best things that you can do while dieting is just accept that, hey, I'm dieting. Being hungry is okay. It's just a sign that my body's in a calorie deficit and that's a good thing. Trying to, trying to flip that in your head to, hey, I'm going to embrace this a little bit. This is just my body being like, hey, you're in a calorie deficit. If anything, that's a good sign that you're you're moving in the right direction and doing the right thing. Rather than fearing being a little hungry here and there and stuff like that. And granted, that can definitely go too far. And like you don't want to be waking up in the middle of the night hungry and stuff like that. But try to look at that as a good thing can definitely be helpful. And then also gradually increasing that food volume as your diet gets longer and longer can definitely help leave some kind of ammunition for you for when things start getting a little bit more challenging. And I think that if you get crazy with a food volume in the off season, then I've said this before, it's almost like you're you're like comparing or preparing yourself for a food competition to where you're eating all this food, all this food volume and stuff like that. And then maybe you're getting used to eating all this food. And then when you go into a diet, it could definitely make things a lot more challenging. So generally trying to keep your food volume pretty similar year round, I think is a a really good idea. All right. And the final question here this week, if I'm going through a really stressful time, is it better to just not train? And Chiprian, if you're watching this, don't worry about what I'm about to say. This doesn't apply to your specific situation. And for everybody that doesn't know who Chipperon is, he is a client of mine. He is the man. He's had an awesome transformation over these last few years. And he's going through a very challenging part of school right now. And he he literally just doesn't have the capacity to really make it to the gym a whole lot. And I would say if you're going through a stressful time, for me anyways, the best thing that I can do is at least try to make it to the gym a few times. Because really training in the morning, that sets up my day so nicely for the rest of the day. And I just have more energy. I feel better. And yes, am I losing that that hour of time in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And is it more than an hour? Because you have to commute. You have to change. You have to eat. All that stuff. Yes. Like if your training session's an hour, you're probably going to have to block off too. But do I gain back that time with feeling better throughout the day, being more productive and just having a generally better day, I think I still do, even when I'm going through a really stressful period. Now, are there other things you can do? Like, okay, maybe I'm going to change my training split to be a three-day-per-week full-body split to just have a maintenance phase here to where maybe I train Saturday, Sunday, and then Wednesday, one day during my work week. 
Maybe. Maybe that would be a really good approach. But I generally think that the answer is usually not to just not train. And I generally think that there's almost always something that you can do to at least maintain your muscle or heck, if it's like, okay, it's going to be a stressful time for the next year. I want to keep making progress. That's a really good time to start considering, okay, what is the most important thing that you want to make progress on over the next next year? And really specializing, okay, I'm going to really focus on this part, but I'm okay if I don't make as much progress in these other areas. And really prioritizing that can really help you manage that time a lot better. And are there trade-offs with doing that? Absolutely. But can you still make some progress with that? I definitely think so. And doing things that are going to be more efficient in the gym, like even to the level of not doing single arm movements and making sure to do movements with both arms, that can be more efficient. Supersetting everything as much as you can. Like even if you're doing squats, okay, well, I'm doing squats. What could I potentially superset that with? Well, honestly, the only thing might be like biceps or delts that you can kind of get away with. But trying to get away with those non-impeding supersets as much as you can, that can be really helpful. Not getting crazy with a volume, that can be helpful. Drop sets, giant sets, mile reps, all that stuff can allow you to get a good stimulus in a little amount of time, all right? So I generally think that really, really try to think about anything that you can do at the very least to maintain your muscle mass and try to not just take the the kind of easy route of, I'm stressed out. I'm not going to train. I generally think that that is not the kind of best approach for most people. Now, if you're okay with just taking a step backwards and not, and seeing a little bit of muscle atrophy over the few months to where you don't train, then that's a trade-off you have to be willing to accept. But if you can just get in one or two sessions to maintain, that's going to be a lot better. And then even better, if you could get in three or four sessions and prioritize muscle group superset stuff like that then you can even make progress during that time all right so really try to do what you can in those times i totally understand shit comes up 2020's been it's been a year to remember that's for sure but i often think that you know hey do what you can the answer is usually not to just kind of step on the sidelines and Chiprian, I know that you're not training for this portion of stressful time, but you're also okay with that trade-off and you're going to be just fine when you get back into things. All right, my man. So that's all I got for you guys this week. I really appreciate you tuning in. It does mean a lot to me. And if you have any questions or anything like that, just leave them down below and I'll help you out as best I can. All right. All right. See you guys.